All right, guys, welcome. For those of you who are, who are here, those of you who are not Larry Roberts, welcome. I want this a little higher. I'm going to steal this thing. Here we go. Whoever this is, I say thank you. There, because I'm a little taller. Cool. Well, my name is Sam Larson. I'm a wilderness living skills instructor from the tropical wonderland of uh, Nebraska. So I actually drove quite a ways north uh, to get here to meet with you all. But uh, happy to be here. This is my second time at the symposium. I was here two years ago for my first time. Last year I was super busy working on a, a TV show. Uh, those of you who know Larry Roberts, he was not that busy around that time. He was done with his portion of filming our TV show since so he was here. Um, but I want to talk to you guys today about some of my findings so to speak, and a topic that I don't think really gets discussed too much in depth in the world of survival. We'll go about, we'll go about uh, talking about why it maybe doesn't get discussed very much, and uh, we'll talk about some intricacies of it. But I do want to establish off the bat, um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a physiologist, I, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, I don't do any of that kind of stuff. Uh, Terry Barney was talking about survival experts uh, last night said, you know, be careful if someone says they're a survival expert. Uh, everyone says they're not a survival expert. I'm here to tell you, I am actually the survival expert. So if you're looking for them, I'm, I'm right here. Uh, so ask me anything and I'll tell you something and it might not be true. Um, but I'm here to talk at you for a while. And basically my plan here, I'm going to go through what I've got for you guys, present the information, and then we'll have some time for Q&A after I'm all, all finished up. But I wanted to talk about survival and the economy of calories. So everyone hears, and if you watch a, a survival TV show, they say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose calories if I do this. I have to conserve calories. Uh, and then they're you know, eating poop and jumping off waterfalls and stuff like that. Um, but like, what, what does this really mean? And the core of the question is like, how long can the human body sustain itself without eating, without any kind of food? What are the limits of the human body? Does anyone have a straight up answer for me? How long can someone go without eating? Does anyone want to like throw out a number for fun? 30 days, okay. 40 plus, you think? The rest of your life. The rest of your life? You could just... I heard about these strange like cult-esque groups where they're like, we live on sunlight now. Or they just, like, we don't kill anything, we just soak in the sun for our nutrition like the plants. Uh, I don't think it works that way. But I, I don't know. I didn't, I'm not a highly educated human being. One really fun thing that people have come up with throughout the years is the rule of threes. I don't know how the rule of threes was invented. I assume it was something to do with military survival, but I'm not sure. Um, the gist of the rule of threes is you survive three minutes without air, three hours without shelter in a harsh environment, Three days without water, three weeks without food. And I added this one here, this is just for fun. Three years without paying your taxes before you go to prison for your whole life. Um, that, that one's probably the closest to being accurate, to be, to be truthful. Um, it's a fun thing to teach because it can tell you kind of your priorities. So of course, it's gonna go air, okay, if you can't breathe, you're screwed. Um, you need shelter, of course, if you're out in the snow. Um, keeping your body at 98.6, super important. So we're going to throw three hours out there, three days without water. You know, water would be your next thing because you get real thirsty, you dry up, you're going to die faster. Um, and then food, yeah, it's not as important, so we'll put it at three weeks. Um, the bad thing about the rule of threes is that none of these are actually anywhere close to being accurate. It depends on your physiology, um, what your metabolism is, what the temperature's like outside, what the weather's like outside, what part of the world you're in. So really, no part of the rule of threes is super duper uh, legit. And it's kind of important to be legit if you're dealing with uh, survival. I have a bunch of buddies who still use it. Uh, they're super cool. I'm just not a huge fan of the rule of threes. So how long can you really survive without food? And the textbook answer, right? Rule of threes, three weeks. That's been adopted. But the best way to view how long we can go without food is to take a macro look at this and to look back at you know, what, what has our body been doing 
for the entirety of human history. So a macro look. Historically, we were hunters and gatherers. So if you go back, let's just throw a date out there. Let's just say 200,000 years ago, there was something that looked really, really human-like and was pretty intelligent and formed uh, family groups and they did each other's hair and they ate decent food and cooked their food. And we're gonna say basically you could be a human back then. Um, those people went a long time without food because they were hunting. When you're hunting, you don't get food every day necessarily, especially depending where you are. Some days are plentiful, some days you get nothing. Uh, a good example would be up in the Northwest, they have their salmon runs, that's seasonal. So sometimes you got more food than you can eat. You try to preserve as much as you can, but there's gonna be some times where there's not as much food. Um, say at a time of year where fruit is ripe. You can binge on fruit and you try to save as much as you can, but there's gonna be days of famine. There's gonna be days where you don't have that much to eat. So fasting and binging uh, or bulking and fasting is what I've got here. Those are kind of your, your priorities. And that was true basically for everyone. Cause the cool thing we all have in common, we all have like native ancestors if you go back far enough. If you're white or you're native or you're black, whoever you are, you got native ancestors. Something we all have in common. And if you are way up north, you got the caribou. When the caribou, caribou go through, you hunt your caribou. Um, you can eat a lot of fresh meat right away, bulk up, preserve what you can. There's gonna be days where you don't have a bunch of food. Um, if you're in the Great Plains, you got the buffalo hunt. It's kind of the same deal. You got one or two annual buffalo hunts, and then it's, it's different food-wise throughout the year. Um, so that's what I look at as far as looking at natives throughout history, and that's how it works. My buddy Tim Smith, who owns the Jack Mountain Bushcraft School, he told me a story where they actually go up north to the Cree for cultural tours, and they were talking to the Cree about traveling to their native hunting grounds, and uh, he was telling them what they bring with them, and their list of supplies is like coffee, tobacco, and like maybe a couple of other things. But coffee and tobacco aren't really food, but they always had those things because they loved them. And if they would go a day without killing an animal, they'd be without food for that day. And someone asked that guy, they were like, hey, what do you do without food for the day? He said, well, if you don't have food for the day, you're hungry. And then you get food later, and then you're not hungry anymore. So to these people, these hunter-gatherers, spending one day without food, it's not a big deal. You just are naturally fasting. Our bodies have been doing this for a long time. And how evolution works, it's not an overnight change. So our bodies are essentially the same as these hunter-gatherers that were before us 200,000 years ago. We're operating the same way as we did back then. That's why some of us can put on weight like super easily. Like I'm not super fat. I'm not like Midwest fat. I'm like Midwest moderate right now is what I call myself. So what are some modern studies? How, is, how has starvation been studied uh, in modern times? And it's a little bit fun to talk about because it's only been studied by Nazis, commies, and Minnesotans, ironically. Um, you could get all those guys together. Um, so the Nazis, obviously, they have, uh, you know, what, what they were doing, super bad. Um, the commies, they also had, you know, POWs. They weren't treating very well, but they were studying them. Uh, and then Minnesotans, so it's really interesting. Uh, the Minnesota study, basically back in the 40s, 40, 44, 45, um, there was a study done by a group of conscientious objectors at the University of Minnesota. They found out uh, University of Minnesota around there, there was a lot of like uh, religious objections to going to the war. So they had all these able-bodied men that they could do tests on, and they decided to do a starvation test. This happened, I think their study started maybe three months or so after the discovery of the first concentration camps. So they knew they had those, uh, the death camps. How do you restore someone's body after that? But they were also looking at what do we do when there's famine? Uh, what do we do to soldiers who have been out? Very active human beings um, who can sometimes have limited food for a long time. We're talking months and months and months. And the study was really interesting. Basically, they made them exercise quite a bit, like a soldier would have to exercise. And for the first 20 or so weeks, they let them eat whatever they wanted. They could binge and, and just have a good old time. And then after that, they cut that off and they were limited to about 1,500 calories a day. And as that kept going on, 1,500 calories isn't like a super 
small amount for most of us. I'd probably be like pretty darn hungry at that point, but it's not like they're having zero calories, right? But under 1500 calories, they were losing weight like crazy during the exercises. And some of the findings are really interesting. You can read more about them in um, this book here is The Great Starvation Experiment. And then it was all published in, I believe, a two volume set, The Biology of Human Starvation. Um, several of these guys became so obsessed with eating that they actually became cooks after the study and pursued that as like a lifelong career. And then on top of that, uh, some of them went 30 days without pooping, without having any kind of bowel movement, even at 1500 calories a day, pretty insane. And uh, my favorite story though, is that one of the guys halfway through the starvation experiment, he, uh, he was cutting wood and he, he severed his thumb. And in, in an interview later, he couldn't determine whether he did it on purpose or whether it was an accident, <laughs> whether he just got ticked off and cut his, his thumb off. Um, Polar explorers are also a pretty cool example of this. So let's talk about polar explorers. They're going to get to the pole by hook or by crook. They're trying to get there. So they're under you know, severe stress with their bodies. They're really pushing themselves. A lot of polar explorers have found that they can only successfully utilize about 5,000 calories per day under those specific circumstances in the polar regions. So even if you can get you know, X amount of food and fulfill yourself, so to speak, um, you might not be able to utilize all the calories that you're taking in. So polar explorers are a really good example of some, uh, some studies that have been done for starvation. Uh, and then there's me. Uh, I'm another study, I guess, that's been done on starvation. So how many of you guys are familiar with the TV show Alone on the History Channel? It's a pretty good turnout. It's like half of you guys. Okay, cool. So I have participated twice in this really strange television survival experiment um, called Alone. And basically the concept of this TV show that I was on is you take 10 survivalists, they're alone in the woods, and they have to stay alone for as long as they can. They film themselves, they have 10 survival items, so very like limited food rations, um, and you basically just stay as long as you can. And the last person standing is like the winner and they get a big cash prize and it's really fun. Um, even though it lasts a long time. So the first time I did it, I lasted 55 days in British Columbia during the early winter. I got second place. And then this most recent season, I actually participated again, got the chance to participate. And uh, I lasted 60 days and became the winner of, uh, of the show. So that was pretty cool. And uh, Oh, uh, I'm not all that, guys. Oh, come on, come on. But so I have some, when it comes to starvation, I've got some personal experience. I've gone days and days and days without eating anything, actually months without eating any, uh, you know, proper meals. So I'm very, very attached to this subject. And I wanted to talk about it uh, from a personal standpoint as well, as well as one of my buddies who participated in a different reality TV show. It's not you, Luke. Uh, Luke did uh, participate in The Wheel, which is similar. Uh, my friend Dan, who runs California Survival School, he participated in a National Geographic show called Migrations. And basically what they did is they trekked across the Serengeti in Africa, and it was like at least a couple hundred miles. Uh, but there are a couple, a couple key differences between myself and Dan, which I'll explain here. So we have the fat and the skinny. Now, as I said, I'm not Midwest fat. I'm like Midwest moderate, but we're going to call it fat because that's what they said online. Um, so I'm the fat guy. My friend Dan, he is the, uh, the skinny guy. Dan is about six foot one. He's about 155 pounds. So as Dan and I are like instructing survival courses together, I try to stay far enough back so that we don't start looking like the number 10 because uh, that gets a little awkward. We got weird nicknames and such and get bullied. Um, it's a very serious thing. Um, talk about calorie intake. So for me, I went 60 days in Mongolia and my average calorie was between uh, 200 and 300 calories per day for two months. So uh, yeah, that sucks by the way, that's not very fun. Um, and I ended up losing weight really fast at the beginning. So I lost 23 pounds in the first three weeks. So it just fell off of me, but then it started to taper and slow down as I went along and as winter got closer, which is a little strange. Uh, there haven't been a ton of studies done on this, so we don't necessarily know why, you know, what happens to your metabolism, 
Uh, what are you doing to the fat in your body? How fast are you burning muscle? The particulars are really wishy-washy at this point. But I know by the end of my experience, I was only losing one kilo a week. So 2.2 pounds a week, which is you know, very, very slow. So at that rate, I think we had measured before I'd get to, I think day 118 before they had to pull me if it had continued at that. And that would suck by the way, 118 days alone, starving to death would not be a fun deal. Uh, my friend Dan though, and a lot of people think, oh, if I'm skinny, I'm not gonna last very long. Um, somehow his body just kind of adjusted. He had maybe less calories than me per day. He was basically living off of termites and a little bit of beef jerky and then a ration of raw honey that they were given in Africa before their trek and had to kind of haul all the way through. And so it, it kind of goes to show you that even though he was a skinny guy, his body, he, is, he still had those same ancestors. He still had the hunter gatherers in his DNA and he was able to go a long time as a skinny dude without a whole lot of food. He blew the three weeks out of the water that they say in the rule of threes. Vitamins is a huge part of it. So when you're depleted, it's really good to get some vitamins of some sort. So uh, honey is a really good vitamin. Uh, if you have any kind of herbs around, one of the things I did in Mongolia that I credit to helping me stay healthy throughout the experience is I gathered armloads of herbs like yarrow, plantain. I gathered uh, some wild leaves. And then also I'm trying to think of all the things I gathered, a little bit of dandelion root. And then I had some pine trees that I could pull pine needles off of for tea. And I would make herbal teas every single day. I'd make two pots of herbal tea, so at least four quarts a day. And that would be what I drank. And I think that helped me stay really, really healthy and happy, even though I was <laughs> slowly starving to death, to be quite honest. And ketosis is the big deal. Raise your hand if you've heard of ketosis. It's basically your body goes into a state where you start burning uh, you know, ketones. And I think that is a state that you go into in starvation. You have no carbs, no you know, sugars and all that crap is out of your system. The first thing people say is you lost a lot of weight in your face. And that's usually where you store your water. When you go into ketosis, it all kind of goes away. And uh, the most interesting thing to me is that a lot of the weight loss, so to speak, is actually your water weight. So I said I lost 23 pounds in 21 days. How much of that was actually water weight though? How much of that was not even real fat? Probably most of it was just water weight. So it's not real pounds. So basically the minute you get back to society or whatever, you, you eat a cheeseburger and you drink your, your soda or water and you get those pounds right back. They just go right back on you. And now I want to talk about the survival situation. So the importance of calories in a survival situation and what type of action is actually necessary in order to sustain yourself in a survival situation. Essentially, are you better off like pursuing all the food in the forest? Or are you better off just like hunkering down? And most of you guys kind of know how I stand on this already, but there's a comparison here between survival, which in my mind is taking a realistic look at your situation and saying, what can I do? to help myself to either get out of this or just survive by any means necessary. Then there's sexy vival. Sexy vival is like what they really like to put on TV shows. So sexy vival is you set this great big deadfall trap and you trap a big animal and it's really cool looking or climbing mountains you don't have to climb or uh, drinking your piss, stuff like that. That's sexy vival. Anything that makes you look a little bit sexy. And that's what they like to put on TV. Uh, real survival isn't, isn't usually super duper sexy. Um, and we're talking about long term in this. We're not talking about an average survival scenario. We're talking about one that goes pretty long. And there's a few that have gone long, unfortunately. Uh, gal down in New Mexico I know of, she went like 45 days in the Gila wilderness, ended up surviving. Um, guy on a life raft, I think in the Atlantic, went like 75 days, uh, minimal food in both cases. But generally, uh, as Terry actually mentioned last night, it's over pretty quick if you're in a survival situation. But hunting, okay, let's talk about this. We've all been around camp today. Who has seen, who has seen a deer in camp? Anybody? Nobody's seen one in camp? Who's been around the last four or five days? Who's seen a deer in camp? Anybody? No? Fox? Dogs, yep, yeah. domestic dog, yeah. You can tell he's done some training over in Asia. 
uh, domestic dog around, uh, around camp. That's about it to eat. Uh, I've seen some squirrels, right? Maybe hunt some squirrels. Uh, I've seen maybe two or three squirrels. So you can eat two or three squirrels. Uh, there's no fat on them, so that sucks. Uh, say if you were a really good shot with a bow or with like a throwing stick, you got all three of those squirrels in one day. The effort you put into getting those squirrels is probably going to be a lot more than the calories you're going to get out of those squirrels. And then you've killed all your squirrels in this little area, so you have to travel to other areas to get more squirrels. So while it's really, really good for supplementing you, and in some areas, I'm sure there's areas of Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota where you could just about live off of squirrels, especially in like Michigan where they're like these enormous cat-like squirrels. Um, not that I've eaten cat. Um, but in the reality, in certain areas that don't have the game that we have um, in, in more rich environments like this, it's going to be very difficult. Talk about trapping. Trapping is a really good way of getting food because it's passive, but you still have to travel to check every single one of your traps every day. You have to scout to find the best trap locations. You have to find bait for your traps. And if your traps are falling over or getting triggered, uh, you have to make sure your traps are really easy to set every day. So while this is maybe a little better than active hunting, um, it's very difficult to be able to sustain yourself on this. There are instances where people, especially Native Americans, have been able to sustain themselves on trapping. Um, in particular, there's this one guy down in, uh, I think it was Utah, or maybe Arizona, and he had 100 Paiute deadfall traps and uh, also promontory peg deadfall traps, and he just set them all out, and he was feeding a family of four for like 20 or 30 years off these little stick traps on, on uh, little pack rats that he was finding. So it can be done, but very, very difficult, especially if you're in an environment that doesn't have thousands of pack rats all over the place, right? And then fishing. Um, raise your hand if you've gone fishing this year and caught like 10 or 12 fish in a day. I thought this would be like a way more arrogant group than that. You guys, very cool. There's only like three of you. Okay, cool. Yeah, so like it's hard to catch a lot of fish in a day. If you're going to have sustainable calories, that's about where we're at. It's like 10 or 12 fish a day um, with all the work you're doing. Shelter building, getting firewood, cutting firewood. Um, Get, even getting to like your fishing location is hard in a lot of ways. Standing out by a lake is gonna, gonna take calories away from you. So fishing's really difficult. Raise your hand if you've gone fishing this year and gotten skunked. Who's gotten skunked this year? My hand is like both hands up at this point. All right, I get skunked all the time and it stinks. So you get skunked, you lost all those calories and you don't have any calories to put in. So really sucks for your survival, survival situation. Uh, so to speak. There is something to be said as far as the psychology of that, saying, okay, I'm out, I'm actively looking for food, my situation is going great, I'm happy, I'm gonna provide for myself, I have hope, there's that. Um, but it might not be the smartest thing from a, a real world perspective. Um, the real world perspective, okay, how can I get found? Um, and how, like, what's the longest I can last and, and get found? Um, so calories in, calories out. So I always kind of range through the, the importance of rations. So anytime you're out in the woods and you're going to some real remote location, always have more than enough emergency rations. Uh, even at your home, it's helpful to have emergency rations. I read somewhere that there's only like five or six days worth of food in any metropolitan area at a time. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, um, if something happens where you can't get food to the grocery stores, we're in bad shape. I know I am sometimes. So making sure you have those extra rations, being proactive rather than having to look for food at the last minute when you run out or you're in trouble from something. So I want to make this really relevant to you guys. So let's pretend we're out on a winter trip and something goes wrong. We're in a real bad shape. We get our, our wall tent burns down. Uh, the sled team runs off, something like that. Uh, bad stuff. The dog team, I should say. Not your like humans that are pulling sleds with you, leave you in the, in the woods. Um, there's three things, three steps that you can do to sustain your body in a winter environment. These are the three steps that essentially won me like half a million dollars last year. So the first step, stay warm. Sounds really simple, right? Stay warm uh, through insulation, you know, wearing your clothes, 
making bows uh, around you in like a bow bed type formation, staying warm every, uh, every instance. So insulation, getting a big park uh, uh, activity. So if you're not insulated, doing something active. So cutting wood, looking for firewood, um, anything active, but you don't want to do, be too active because then you're burning a ton of calories. Uh, and then heat source. So whether that's your stove, which is probably not recommended because then you're burning your stove fuel and you're going to run out of that uh, or firewood. So sitting by a fire at all times. So essentially what my day would look like, how I conserve calories in my sleeping bag, always insulated up. Um, if I wasn't in my sleeping bag and I wasn't by a fire, I was actively getting firewood or setting traps or doing something active like that. So I was producing heat for myself uh, and then sitting by a heat source. So if I wasn't doing either of those things, if I was hydrating for the day or something like that, I was sitting directly by my fire. Hydration. This is what's really hard sometimes in winter environments. Uh, people don't think they need to drink a lot, but you need to drink a ton. Uh, one gallon per day. For those of you who are Canadians, that's a boot four quarts a day of really, really hot water. Must be hot, as hot as you can tolerate. That's how hot we need our water when we're hydrating in the cold. You want to warm up your inner, inner fire. And then add vitamins if possible. If you've got pine needles around, uh, make pine needle tea. If you can identify uh, even like the skeletons of the last year's yarrow plants, uh, adding that to your tea, that'll help you out. Um, any vitamins you can get into your system while you hydrate, super important. So what I would do is I would drink about two quarts a day, two quarts at night. And then if I was active, I'd eat snow as long as I felt like it wasn't too cold and I was okay. And then sleep, human hibernation. This is my favorite one. You should sleep at least 12 to 16 hours a day. And that sounds like a long time, but if you play little mental games with yourself, like you plan, uh, plan your hunting trip or your next winter trip or a big canoe trip, that's what I always do. Um, stay in your sleeping bag and just sleep, just go to bed. Um, you do have to be able to arrange yourself a really good, comfortable sleeping situation though. So being able to make a bed out of your natural environment. So gathering leaves and limbs and making a debris bed, um, finding a way to shelter yourself uh, and be able to sleep. That's key. Um, and I heard this one time in closing, survival is very simple as long as you can make a cup of tea and take a nap. You can survive almost anywhere in the world for a month to two months. That's your tip. All you have to be able to do, take a nap, make tea. Again, that's not original. I heard that from someone else. I just forget who, otherwise I'd credit them. Um, but that's what I got today for how to starve yourself to death really successfully in the woods. Uh, do we have any questions? First season of alone when I was eating mice, I would say I got between 30 and 40 mice and I started about day 30. How second time? Second time, um, it was a little more and they were like bigger because they were like the Eurasian voles. So they're these stocky little things with like nice juicy hams. Um, probably 50 or so with a couple of stretches that were really crummy where I wasn't getting anything. Right. Yeah. Bait, um, I brought trail mix as one of my emergency rations and I had like a couple of raisins, so I'd use those for bait. Beyond that, I would use insects and then I would actually just kind of cannibalize the rodents. So I would use internal organs or entrails that I can't eat. Then I would slice up the hide and tie that onto the end of bait sticks and use that as, as bait. And it worked pretty well. You know, it would make sense to gain weight. I gained my weight primarily through like depression. Um, <laughs> it's a little joke. <laughs> uh, I gained my weight from like uh, working a lot and eating a lot of fast food, uh, not necessarily to go on the show, but it would make some amount of sense to gain weight probably before going out. So you had more to lose, uh, depending on if you had time. If you have like three or four months to prep, sure, put on like a good amount of weight as long as you're staying kind of fit. Um, if you have two weeks to prep, then you're not going to be able to do a whole lot for yourself. I think I had six weeks total. Um, 
but I was pretty busy during the six weeks that I had to prep. I had like a baby that was born seven days before I left, and so I was pretty busy. But generally, yeah. Yeah. In the TV survival situation you found yourself in, did you guys get guidance or even pressure to do things other than what you suggested? Be like, build a sketchy tree stand and sit in it all day? <laughs> Uh, Alone is really good at being hands off. So they never instruct us like you have to do something like please do something that would look good on TV. It's more of a personal pressure that you put on yourself because you're wanting to do a good job in documenting your experience because it is going out for people. So if I was just out there on my own in like a real survival situation, it's, it's something good to point out. It's not you're not a real survival situation. It's there for TV. Um, then I would not be acting maybe the same as I did on a loan where I have to put something on footage. If I was just laying down, I'd feel stupid. So, so yeah. Um, but they didn't make us do anything. That's a really, really nice thing about the show. Yeah. Uh, talk about your clothing or your layering. What, what was you did for uh, Well, I did have my boreal shirt from Lester River Bushcraft, which made a huge difference. Um, so for four easy payments of just forty nine ninety nine, it could be yours. Actually, it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> Selling them for cheap. Um, no, so my basic layering system was like merino wool, uh, base layers. I had three layers of wool socks. I had old military canvas mucklucks, so super breathable. Um, I'm trying to think. It's been a while. I had a fleece shirt over my merino shirt. Then I had a, I think just a wool sweater over that. I had this like wool rich sweater that I got for 20 bucks off eBay. And then I had Carhartt bib overalls, and which is good if you're in a stationary scenario, it's, you, know, you could wear some heavy stuff. Uh, and that was basically what I wore. And then a fur hat and a, a neck scarf. So that was basically what I wore every day. And when I got super, super, super cold, I put on my Lester River Bushcraft uh, boreal shirt. And when it got even colder, I put on a huge down uh, North Face parka when the boreal shirt wasn't quite cutting it. You get that big parka. Um, <laughs> it's like you made it awkward. The third time was enough. OK, please. Scott, do you have a question? It's really fun to eat after you've been starving for like two, two months. One thing I did notice though in observing how everyone took their first food, there's actually a video out of everyone like experiencing their first meal. Um, most people were saying, oh, the flavors are so good. I actually complained a little bit about the flavor. I thought they made the broth a little bit bland. They should have spiced it up a little bit more. I was very grateful for it. Um, but yeah, heightened sense of flavor and then a desire to put a lot of flavor in what you eat. So we have stories of like people going home to their spouses and just spicing the crap out of all their food and and something for the family to adjust to, I guess. <laughs> yes? Did, when you finished the uh, extended stay, let's say, mm -hmm. and did, did they have to do anything special for meals or anything? To, I mean, you just can't. Yeah, yeah. So this this year, uh, they actually hired like a swanky New York nutritionist to help us out. So we had a plan for like two or three weeks after the show that was essentially to get our body back into uh, you know normal working condition. So it started off like broth. We ate some whole grains. Um, we had really high fat yogurt that we ate. I snuck a couple brownies and didn't tell my wife. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a taper of broth. And then after a while, I could eat meat. And then they said, well, you should basically never eat sugar again. And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but a, a, a big, long taper, yeah. Okay. yeah. Can you talk us through how you utilize the, the mice and the bulls? Yeah. So how I would utilize them, um, technically, if you're looking for as many calories as possible, you would roast the whole thing uh, or boil the whole thing, pull out the entrails, and then just eat 
everything. So the skin with the hair that's been cooked off by the fire, you'd eat what's left of the eyeballs and the tongue and, and the brain and all that stuff. I did it a little bit differently. Uh, so my technique was to basically skin it down, like the whole head and everything, and take the entrails out. Um, and then I would use the skin and the entrails for like bait and it worked really well. And then I would eat everything else. So I would eat uh, you know, the kidneys and the liver and the, and the heart and uh, of course all the meat that was on the animal and the brain and everything that was left after the cooking. Yeah, yeah, the bones are really, really thin, so it was easy to boil down the bones and to get, get broth out of those. Super thin. I had three at once. I'm going to go with the young man over there who raised his hand. Yes, sir? Yes, yes. I'm curious psychologically, uh, are you a dreamer? Did you have any weird dreams over the whole period? <laughs> oh, no. Um, yeah, I had some really weird dreams going on, especially like hunger dreams. I had like failure dreams and hunger dreams. So the hunger dreams were me trying to get food unsuccessfully and then failure dreams was me uh, trying to tell people why I had dropped out and coming up with really, really dumb reasons and feeling really, really bad about doing it. So it kind of motivated me to not, you know, quit for some dumb reason. And I, uh, I'll, tell one of, I'll tell one of the dreams. Um, basically, I was walking across a parking lot with my mom, um, and we saw this donut shop. I was like, Mom, let's go get dinner at the donut shop. She said, Sam, they don't serve food at the donut shop. And I said, what if they do? And she said, oh, maybe they will. And I go there, and I was like, do you guys have any pulled pork sandwiches or hamburgers? And they were like, wouldn't you know it, we have both of those at the donut shop today. And I said, great. And so I had, I made an order of like donuts, pulled pork, burger, some ribs. I had a whole plate and uh, was sitting there, you know, just hanging out. And then it was coming towards me and they sat it down in front of me and then I woke up. Uh, as soon as they, actually, this one, real quick, it's actually pretty funny too. Um, I went to this new restaurant that had opened up in my town with my wife and we sat down and the waiter, you know, didn't come over. The waitress didn't come over and and I kind of flagged her down. I was like, hey, uh, is there any way we could get some menus so we could get some food? We're a little bit hungry. And she's like, oh, oh yeah, I'll look for some menus. And went back, and it was a long time later. Hey, do you have any menus? She's like, ah, I don't have any menus. I was like, that's okay. Do you have any cheeseburgers? Can you just bring a cheeseburger without? She said, you really have to order off the menu, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and then she, she brought out this like old tote full of like scrap paper. She was like, look through here, and maybe there's a menu. And then you can order your food off this menu. And I was going through, and it was all these, like, kids' menus that had been scribbled on, and, like, they'd done the crossword puzzles and stuff. And I was, like, looking through, trying to find the, And I just couldn't find any, anything that had, like, food to order on it. And I'm just digging and digging through this tote, and then I wake up. And so that waitress didn't give me any food. So, yeah, there's some bummer dreams out there. Any long-term effects? Long-term effects? Yeah, so... <laughs> Fun fact, the psychologist who worked on the show is fantastic. She's like number one in the field, in my opinion. Great gal. She helped them with the first few seasons of The Apprentice. So it only leads me to believe that I was being psychoanalyzed by the same person who had psycho psychoanalyzed our current president. <laughs> um, and I wish there was something more to that story because it could be funny, but that's it. Um, but anyhow, this, this gal, basically she... Uh, was talking to me and I was explaining what I was going through and what I was kind of feeling and we determined that I had had a little bit of ADHD before the show or whatever they call ADHD these days but now my ADHD is like 10 20 times worse than it was before the show so I need like powerpoints and things to focus now or I'll like I'll even be talking about things and I'll be distracted by something I see out on the lake um, it's really it's really difficult for me now so just like super heightened awareness of different things going on, lack of ability to focus because you want to focus on what I want to focus sometimes. So, Anyone else? Scott, yep. Uh, two questions. Uh, you're about eating inner pine tree bark, and I don't want to cut this too bad. Did you ever do that? And would you bring a net? Um, 
I would not bring a net because there was not a really good place in hindsight on my location to put a net. I actually made a net myself and I just tried it out. I spent a few days trying it out and just never find a place that it actually worked. Um, as far as the pine tree bark, it's legit, like it's carbohydrates. Um, but something you don't read in the survival manuals is apparently if you binge eat pine tree bark, it stuffs you up and you have to be medically evacuated. And that happened to a guy uh, in the show this season. He ate too much pine bark and his body couldn't take it. Um, towards the end, he started grinding it up instead of eating it in strips. And that maybe would have helped a little, but um, he kind of learned that the hard way. I was in a pretty good spot because I didn't have any pine trees on my location. Actually, I had three pine trees and one of them was like a little Charlie Brown Christmas tree. So uh, I didn't have any pine bark to consume. It was pretty easy. Anyone else? All right. We'll probably do these. We'll do these two and then, uh, and then we'll be good to go. Yes. Um, it was definitely my, <laughs> yeah, it was definitely my longest solo. Um, I didn't grow up necessarily in the outdoors. I really liked the outdoors. I was in scouts. Um, my parents were never in the outdoors, like camping or anything, but they tried to support my passion. Uh, I, I say my skill learning started about age 18. Uh, I did a big immersion program at a bushcraft school in Maine called the Jack Mountain Bushcraft School. Uh, I went back there as a teacher's assistant did some independent studying down in the Southwest, uh, went out to a couple gatherings like, uh, like Rabbit Stick uh, in, the, in the West, I guess, not Southwest. Um, and then just some independent exploring, went up to Ontario, did a big canoe trip, and then uh, got the call at like 21 and see if I, they, they basically said, we read an article that you wrote where you mentioned you were living in the woods one time, would you like to do our TV show? And I said, okay. Yeah. So if anyone wants to get on TV, if you're not picky about the show, it's really easy now um, compared to before. They'll take anyone. They'll take anyone. They took me. They'll take anybody. Twice. Seriously. Yeah, twice, right? <laughs> like, that's a joke, right? <laughs> yes? The pet item that you brought, would you, how would you change that to that Oh, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Um, so I got dropped in a place that didn't have any sizable trees. So obviously the three and a half pound ax that Ben from bensbackwoods.com uh, shipped me uh, was no use because you don't use a three and a half pound ax to cut down willows, right? So I would have chosen something else. I would have chosen maybe a pruning saw and left my buck saw at home. Um, I would have definitely brought fishing line um, because maybe if I had traveled far enough and, and gotten lucky, I could have caught some fish. Um, no, and I'm glad I didn't have a bow. There wasn't a lot of game where I was. I saw maybe two grouse, uh, never saw a squirrel, never saw any rabbits or anything like that. Never saw tracks for, for squirrels or anything like that. So pretty limited game throughout the, it, it's again, it kind of goes back to the hunting. Um, Dave Nisha is a great example. He spent 73 days in Patagonia. And then he did my season in Mongolia, went 38 days, I believe. He lost more weight in 38 days running around hunting in the woods than he did in 73 days in Patagonia. So yeah, huge, yeah, he's really cool. Huge like, calorie expenditure, so that's it. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. And have a super time for the rest of the symposium.